Hello, new Darktable user or potential new Darktable user. In this video, I am going to give you a very quick run through of the basics to get you up and running with Darktable 3.6. Let's go. Hi, and welcome to episode 97 of Understanding Darktable. I'll assume that you're new to the channel, in which case, hi, I'm Bruce. I'm assuming you've never looked at Darktable before, you're brand new to it, and you just want to know how to get up and running. And in this video, I will do my best to give you the basics without inundating you with a bunch of information that you're not quite ready for yet. Before we start, one very quick thing. This little thing here is not part of Darktable. That is a Linux app called Keymon, and it will show you any keystrokes that I execute on the keyboard or any mouse clicks that I do with my mouse. That just helps you to understand what I'm doing if I get carried away and move too quick. All right, so you've never seen Darktable. The first thing you are going to want to do is to import some images. Let's just have a quick look at the interface here. When you fire up Darktable for the first time, this will be the view you will be in. It is called the Light Table view. You will notice that there is Light Table, and then there is Dark Room, and then there is Other. Pretty much all of the other views are things that you won't use quite as often. 99% of the time, you will be in either the Light Table or the Dark Room. The Dark Room view is where you process a single image at a time. We'll get to that later in this video. So you are in the light table view and up here in the top left hand corner is a module called import. Inside the import module you will find two buttons, add to library and copy and import. It is critical that you understand the difference between these two things. Add to library will invoke this window and it assumes that your images already live in a folder somewhere on your file system. So it doesn't matter whether you're on a laptop or a desktop machine, but it assumes that the files are already in a permanent location that you are happy with, and you just want to import those files where they currently exist. The other option is the copy and import dialog box. It looks the same, for most of it, but there are a few little differences. And this particular function assumes that your images are not in a final location. This is what you would use if, for example, you've taken the memory card out of your camera, stuck it in a card reader, plugged it into a USB slot on your laptop or desktop machine, and you want to copy those files to a new location and then have Darktable import those images from their new final resting place, if you like. So let's just go back to the add to library option. I think somewhere here I've got some images that I've not imported. You'll notice this box here, select new pictures or only new pictures. If that's unchecked, you will have the option to well, I mean, you always have the option to pick any files you like to import, but by having this checked, Darktable will automatically select any images you point to that haven't yet been imported. Any image which has been imported already will have this tick mark to the left of it. So if we just move through these folders, here we go. Here's a folder that I've not yet imported. So all of these images have been selected. You'll notice if we hit select none, they're now not selected. Select all, they're now selected. The fact that there are no check marks on the left tells us these have not been imported. Once you are happy with the selection, you can click add to library. If you shoot RAW and JPEG and you don't want the JPEGs, just tick the box that says ignore JPEG images. If you are pointing to a folder that has child folders within it, you can click on recursive directory and that will tell Darktable, don't just scan this folder, but scan any folders that are nested underneath this folder. All right, add to library. 
and those images are then imported at their current location. Okay, next we want to look at the copy and import function. For that, I've grabbed a spare SD card that I have previously shot on and attached it to my card reader. So now if I go copy and import, we can see 31 gig volume. So that's a 32 gig card. Click on the DCIM folder and then this folder here. And as we can see, there's a bunch of raw and JPEG images because I was shooting RAW plus JPEG. I don't want the JPEGs, so I will click the ignore JPEG images. And as we can see, they have now disappeared. I'm only seeing the RAW files. Next, we've got a column over here on the right that looks like an eye icon. If you click that icon on the column header, that will turn on thumbnail previews for all of the images in the folder that you are currently looking at. If you don't need it to be generated for the entire folder, you can select it for individual images, but I will turn it on for all of them. I don't need these first few images. I just want to import a couple of these images of my old motorbike. So I might go control click to select non-contiguous files or you can use shift click to multi-select a group of contiguous files. This is fairly common stuff for most applications. Now I could go ahead and click copy and import, but what we've not yet done is told Darktable where we actually want to put these images. Now, most of the time you will have as long as you are an organized individual, <laughs> some sort of parent folder into which all of your images go. But within that parent folder, you might have subfolders. That's certainly the way I work. If I just jump over to my uh, file browser, as you can see, I have a drive called Photos Drive, and within that I have a folder called Photos. But within Photos, I have a whole bunch of different folders that represent different types of photos. So what I might do for, for these particular images that I'm about to import, which I don't need to keep, I'll just put those in my test shots folder. So what I would do is go into that folder and then copy that path because that is the parent folder into which I want the images to go. So I would put that in the field called base directory naming pattern, because that's the base directory or the parent directory into, why, into which I want all my images to go. But then within that folder, within that test shots folder, I want a folder structure that looks like year, and you'll then notice that there is a forward slash, and then there is year, month, day. So you'll notice these text strings, they look quite complicated. What I would suggest is you Google Darktable variables, and you will find the very first result that comes up is a page on darktable.org, and there's Oh, seriously, 30 or 40 variables that you can use to either create folder names or to create file names for your photos based on all kinds of different metadata. So I like to have year and then within the year folder, a folder for year, month, day. So all of my images when they're imported have that type of file structure. If you want to keep the original file names as generated by your camera, DSC 4895.ARW, tick the box that says keep the original file name. If you don't, you can again use those variables or you can use plain text along with spaces and hyphens and whatever else to create a naming convention that means something to you. Like I said, I'm quite happy to keep the original file names of my images because I know I'm going to add metadata later that will help me find any image I want somewhere down the track. So once I'm happy with all of that, I can click copy and import. 
and Darktable will then copy those images from the memory card to that folder that I told it to copy them to. I can then click on one of these images. This module on the left hand column image information will tell me everything about that particular image and if I hover over the full path field we can see that it has copied to photos local, photos, test shots, the year and then year month day and then the full file name of the image. All right so that's got our images into Darktable. Next we might want to add metadata but I'll assume that you're not like me and you just want to get on and process your image. There are two things you could do. One is to simply left click once on an image and then click darkroom or the simpler way is just double click on an image and that will take you into the darkroom view and you are now ready to start processing your image. Next up let's just quickly talk about the module groups. Up here at the top you will see there is show only active modules. So that will show you just the modules that are active on this particular image. So the list of modules shown here will vary depending on what image you are looking at. Because if I've done processing on this image but the next image in the timeline hasn't had certain modules added then you know those modules will either appear or not appear accordingly. Then we've got some basic groups. The base group, the color group, the corrections group and the effects group. All of these groups can be modified and on the right hand side there's a hamburger which shows you different presets. So if you want to see every single module that's available click all. You can click default, you can see deprecated modules. They are modules that used to exist in Darktable. They are now hidden from view by default because the developers would prefer you not to use those modules. However, if you're looking at an image that you processed with an earlier version of Darktable, any module that was used at the time it was processed will always appear in the active modules even if that module is now a deprecated module. Uh, after deprecated you have the search box so if you just want to search for a module by its name you can do that. Then we've got three workflow uh, presets. One for beginner, one for display referred which is now essentially a deprecated workflow which you shouldn't be using and then scene referred which is the workflow you should be using. I'm not going to dive into the, the nitty gritty of what those things mean because I've addressed it in other videos. For now just be content with either using workflow beginner or workflow scene referred. You can then modify these groups through this window but again that's outside the scope of what I want to cover in this particular video. I just want to get you up and running. So we've done an exposure adjustment. Let's suppose we wanted to do a crop. We would go to the crop module. We can select a different crop aspect ratio and yes there are ways to add your own presets here but again outside the scope of this video. Let's suppose I wanted a 4-3 crop then I can do that. I can grab the top and drag downwards. I can grab the bottom and drag upwards. You guess where this is going next right? grab left and drag in or grab right and drag in. You can also grab the corners to crop from two axes simultaneously and you can of course left click and drag this crop window if you just want to do that. You will also see that whilst you are dragging you get a series of numbers displayed in the middle of the crop window that tells you what the output resolution will be of the cropped version of the image. So let's say I wanted to crop into there and I'm happy with that. Double click and that then commits that crop. Now again that's all non-destructive. I can go back at any time and open the module back up and then redo the crop or change the aspect ratio to something else if that's what I wanted to do. Double click to commit. Okay. I'm not going to dive into 
all of the different tools for modifying colors and tones and all that sort of stuff. I'm going to assume you have at least some understanding of how to process an image. Let's say that you have now processed this image and you now want to export this so that you can post it to Instagram or Facebook or you want to send it by email to your auntie. You would come over to the export dialog box or the export module and from here you would choose what is the target. In other words, where do you want to export to? Nine times out of ten, you probably will want file on disk. However, there are a couple of other options there should you want to explore that. If file on disk is what you've chosen, you then have the option to choose an export path. And you have a little browse dialog box here so you can point to a particular folder. I'll just click on the trophy folder because this is a Triumph Trophy motorcycle. Select as output destination. Next, I can choose the output format. Then I can choose, because this is JPEG, what level of compression I want. Again, I can do the wag the dog thing if I want to, or I can just choose the value I want and click enter. I can then choose the size that I want in pixels. So I might say I want this to be 2000 pixels wide. And if I just leave the other value at zero, then Darktable will calculate what the height will be based on the current aspect ratio of the crop. I can then tell it yes or no for upscaling, yes or no for resampling. If I want to change the output profile, and if you're delivering for the web, you really want to leave this on sRGB most of the time. Uh, intent, most of this stuff you don't need to worry about. And once you're happy with that, you can click on export. And if I now jump over to Bruce Pictures Trophy, I will find DSC 48 blah, 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 whatever it was. So if we jump over to Pictures and Trophy and... Let's sort these by when I have exported. There it is, 4891 as a JPEG. There we go. Alrighty, so that has been what I hoped was a fast-paced introduction to Darktable 3.6. It's probably going to be longer than I wish it was, but there's just so much to cover. And obviously there's a thousand things I haven't covered. And a lot of the questions you're probably still kicking around in your head are going to be things that I have addressed in other videos. Please sing out in the question in the comments down below with your questions. I do try to answer every question that comes in. And if I don't get to it, hopefully somebody else will sing out with an answer. Because as a new user, a lot of your questions are probably going to be fairly simple. It's just you don't know where to go to find, you know, that particular feature or how to execute a particular problem. All right, guys, great to have you along. I think you're going to love Darktable if you spend some time with it. It can seem like quite a daunting learning curve when you first start. I know that that's what it was like for me. I first looked at Darktable in 2016, and I spent probably two years getting up and running with it before I started this channel. I started this channel in 2018, and... I think I mentioned earlier in this video, the pace of development on Darktable is just astonishing. For such a small team of developers who are scattered all around the globe, most of them are in Europe, um, for such a small team, the development is amazing. There is constantly new stuff happening. There are two stable releases every year. One mid-year, which is why this version 3.6 is quite new. It only got released a couple of weeks ago, early in July of 2021. And the other stable release is on Christmas Day. And that used to be the only stable release that happened every year. It was always Christmas Day every year was a new stable release. But in 2020, the developers said, we've got so much new stuff coming, we're going to do a mid-year release. This year, 2021, they did the same thing. And they've now said, there's going to be two stable releases going forward from here on. I hope it doesn't become any more regular than that because honestly, I am struggling to keep up as it is. This channel 
grew out of my love for this software and my desire to give back to the community in whatever way I felt I could. And in the course of doing these videos, I've learned a lot about the software myself. Anyway, I could rattle on for hours. That's not my intent. Hopefully this has helped you get up and running. Questions, comments, feedback, sing out down below and I will catch you in the next one.